As I said in the last podcast, this is unfortunately the last episode Kate Waldock is with us. This is very sad for me, but we're going to try to make the best of it by touching a topic that is very dear to her, the lack of diversity in the economic profession and what are the effects of this lack of diversity and what are the ultimate causes. Yeah, I'm not very good at handling goodbyes and or my emotions. So uh, that's all I'm going to say about that or else I'm going to start crying. But I think it's worth noting that this is a topic that was brought up a few months ago, a couple months ago, shortly after George Floyd's death. And I, I got to give some props to Luigi, who said, you know, this is a really, really important topic. And yes, it's important for us to talk about it now. And we, we talked about policing and uh, diversity issues a couple months ago, but he wanted to keep the conversation going. Luigi was like, we should wait until a little bit of this has died down and then do this episode later on so that we sustain attention to this important topic. So I thought that was a good idea, Luigi. And, you know, thanks for suggesting that. In an episode about diversity, we decided to listen to many diverse voices. So we're going to ask a similar question to uh, several people that belong to the profession and uh, they represent underrepresented minorities. For the last time, this is Kate Waldock. Now this is emotional. And from the University of Chicago, this is Luis Zangales. You're listening to Capital Isn't, a podcast about what's working in capitalism today. And most importantly, what isn't. Most economists agree that the field of economics is not very diverse. A Brookings study of over 4,000 professors across various disciplines at top universities was done a few years ago. And what they found was that even though the proportion of Americans that were black at the time of the study was 12%, they only made up 3% of econ professors. Even though the proportion of Latin Americans in the population was 16%, they only made up 5% of economics professors. And even though women make up about half of the population, they only accounted for about 20% of economics professors. Also, there isn't much evidence that these numbers have been improving significantly over time. Absolutely. Finance in particular, which is my my area of expertise, is not a very diverse profession. That's Andres Lieberman, chief data officer at Burn to Give. Until recently, he was a professor at NYU Stern School of Business. And particularly within the senior ranks. I mean, it's even more evident. And I think, you know, science boils down, in, in my opinion, to challenging theories and current ways of thinking. Although I, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that our points of view should not impact our results, they definitely change the type of ideas and the perspectives we bring to the table. And so ultimately, the research we bring to the table really depends on who you are and where you come from. And this is particularly so in social sciences, where you're, you know, you're looking at humans, and so they, your history, your interaction with human beings you know, affects the way you think about human problems. Plus, the next big idea can come from anywhere. And so academia should be open and welcoming to these you know, quote unquote, anywhere. Andres explained very clearly that there are some costs to the profession of not having sufficiently diverse ideas, uh, sufficiently circulation of ideas. In my view, even more important than that, is the economic profession close to new people and new ideas? And lack of diversity might be a signal or might be a sign of a profession that is not actually very welcoming and a profession that is very clubbish. If we have the same set of people looking at the same set of problems for a couple hundred years, <laughs> there's only so much innovation that's going to happen. You bring in a new set of people with the same set of tools, they're going to cook different things and the profession is going to get more interesting. That was Peter Henry, the William R. Berkeley Professor of Economics and Business and former dean of NYU Stern School of Business, uh, who was dean when I was there as a PhD student. And he says that the lack of minority representation shrinks the marketplace of ideas. And we as economists, we're all about markets, right? We need competition of ideas because we talk about competition all the time on this podcast. This goes beyond just American minorities. You can also think internationally, something that Dean Henry is familiar with as a first-generation immigrant from Jamaica. Whether you're a, a Black person from the Caribbean or a Black person from Nigeria, 
your interaction with the world economic system, the US economic system, is different than a white Americans or white Europeans. The value of that is you ask, there are a bunch of different questions that you ask, right? Then a person who comes from that European experience, I'll give you a tangible example of that. I remember reading the colonial origins literature. The bottom line is it's good to be colonized by the British, right? <laughs> right? Here I am from Jamaica, right? I know of a little country called Barbados. And I said to myself, okay, we're both, we're, we're both British colonies. Basically the same people brought to the Caribbean to do the same thing, but yet we have very different economic trajectories in the post-independence period. Why is it? It has nothing to do with our British heritage, there are different policy choices that were made in the context of the same institutional environment. So that, but that question that I brought to development economics, I don't know, I don't think that that question gets asked necessarily by a white American. The diversity around uh, foreign students and professors in, in the profession points to another huge issue in economics, which is the fact that the profession is very U.S.-centric and uh, very U.S.-centric also in uh, the kind of problems that uh, they're interested in and they analyze. So let me give you a particular example. I've, I've always been open to working, working with data from a lot of different countries, not only from the U.S., and in many cases uh, I found while presenting, while submitting to journals, while discussing with other people, I've, I've been met with questions of whether the results generalize, again, quote unquote, to the US. So, you know, a general result is a result that generalizes to the US economy. So really, you know, the starting point of any analysis many times has been really, do I learn anything about the US economy from your result? And so, you know, the value of the contribution and therefore the probability of getting in a journal and therefore the probability of moving up in the ranks has depended on this US centrism. You know, greater diversity brings these new ideas and these new challenges that I think are incredibly important to advance science and to advance to advanced knowledge. I think this is hard to do, particularly in a world like academia, where, where accepted opinions are slow, so, so slow moving. Um, because academics are used to thinking uh, slowly, are used to using their entire arsenal of reason, you know, and skepticism to defend kind of established knowledge to attack new ideas and fresh ideas. And, you know, rightly so, we are very critical and that has helped, that, that helps separate the good from the bad ideas. But, you know, this leads to the unfortunate consequence that you're going to reject novelty and many times people who are diverse are going to come, are, are going to come to the table with novel and fresh ideas. What, what do you think explains this obsession with the United States? Is it just because, you know, the, the schools where both of us were trained and have worked are in the United States, or is there something else going on? No, I think that's that's fundamental. You know, the, the development of the science of economics really is US centric. If you look at the if you look at the most important contributors in the in the last century, really the, the contributions have mainly come from the US. There are notable exceptions, of course. But really, you know, the the, the social science of economics and, and, and finance really has been developed with a view towards explaining phenomenon that we have observed in the US primarily. And this is the way we were trained. This is the way most of people are trained today. You know, it, it has helped us learn a ton about, about the world when doing so, but there are some phenomena that really escape this, this set of empirical facts. You know, people behave sometimes differently in other, in other places. And I think that is super interesting as well. And we shouldn't judge necessarily the, genera the generality of those facts based on, on whether they, they apply to U.S. You know, individuals or not. If you think about cars. That's uh, Ron Williamson, former dean of McDonough Business School at Georgetown University and a former car engineer. And I love his car metaphor. Think of cars. If you think of Italian cars, German cars, American cars, and Japanese cars, they're very different. If you are, and I say I'm a car guy, it's very different in how you think of what's a nice car. If you ask anyone from those groups, what do you look for? What would be your ideal car? I guarantee you, you get four different answers because they approach it differently and the value system is a little bit differently. This perspective and the variant perspectives are really important. 
Because lived experiences are important. That was Lisa Cook, professor of economics and international relations at Michigan State University. And I would echo the words of Janet Yellen when she said that it was the lack of lived experience that uh, led to the groupthink that led to the financial crisis. We didn't just want to talk to tenured or senior ranking professors, though. We also wanted to talk to people who are still in the process of becoming economists. One of our guests is Anna Gifty Apoku Ajman, co-founder of the SADI Collective, an organization geared toward helping Black women enter the fields of economics and finance. I think that question can be answered through economics in a sense, right? If there is a bunch of ideas in a room, then at some point, those ideas are going to compete against each other and the best idea will rise to the top. You know, when we think about diversity and inclusion in economics, it's really about making sure that we get the best economic idea for whatever topic. And a really good example of this not happening <laughs> is the 2008 financial crisis, right? Dr. William Spriggs has been quoted saying that, you know, had Federal Reserve economists been paying attention to the analyses and the commentary of Black and Brown economists, they would have noticed right away that something is coming, right? These sort of early signs were all happening in Black and Brown communities way before it was happening in the larger national population. And so our ent- entire economy depends on economic policies being a reflection of the economy that is serving everyone, right? And so if you are not including everyone in terms of the economic perspectives being analyzed and being used as recommendations for policymakers, everyone suffers, regardless of your race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, whatever, right? All of, all of us suffer from not being able to contribute to the larger economic discourse. If you increase diversity in the economic profession, you will increase the type of research that, that you'll see out there. And finally, that's Luis Lopez, an assistant professor at UIC's business school. And he says that the lack of diversity in terms of recruitment filters all the way up to the top, and that can be dangerous. Recently, there was this article uh, published in the Wall Street Journal that talks about the challenges of working on topics such as race and discrimination and getting that research published in the top econ journals. It pretty much makes the uh, the criticism that even though editors may welcome that type of research and sometimes even publish that type of research, it is very difficult to publish it because the bar, the bar is uh, particularly high. Uh, one reason that the article points out is that the amount of referees who would review this research and who may be sympathetic towards that type of topic uh, could be uh, somewhat slim. And Lopez actually had a personal experience with this. Uh, my thesis advisor, uh, Brent Ambrose, and, and a colleague, Jim Conklin, over at the University of Georgia, we, we recently uh, published a paper at the Review of Financial Studies on uh, mortgage pricing discrimination. We, we focus on the credit fees that borrowers ultimately have to pay to obtain credit. What we ultimately end up finding is that uh, minority borrowers end up paying more broker fees than uh, comparable white borrowers when the loan is originated by a white broker. If, if the courts would see these price differences, it, it is possible that they could even consider them illegal. We, we, we had a hard time um, getting it published. It took us about two and a half years since our initial submission. Uh, we started- It's very surprising to me, right? Because it seems like an important paper. Yes, yes, I, 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 we, we, we thought so too. So we've heard a lot of different opinions, different viewpoints, and I think one of the main themes that we're seeing emerge is that diversity is important because you need different opinions and different viewpoints, right? You need different voices to ask a diversity of questions, to answer questions competitively, right, so that we challenge what we think are established assumptions. And that leads to new ideas, new innovation, and a better understanding of the way that humanity works, because that's essentially what we study as economists. There's also other reasons that diversity is important, one being that diversity itself is an issue that needs to be studied. Sometimes just you have a better view of that or you're more willing to push that agenda if you yourself come from a different background. But if you look at the Supreme Court of the United States, 
today probably is one of the most diverse Supreme Court. On the other hand, they all come from Yale and Harvard, and they all, except I think Clarence Thomas, they come from the East Coast. So how do you measure diversity? If they all come from the same place in terms of cultural formation as a scholar, isn't that lack of uh, diversity? If they come from the same part of the country, isn't that some lack of diversity? Yeah, absolutely. Socioeconomic diversity is just as important as gender diversity and racial diversity. Uh, a lot of this really goes, I mean, it boils down to where you're from and what sort of education you received at an early level. And there's another point that I think is controversial and doesn't really come up as much. It's not cited as one of the, the main reasons that diversity is important. People talk about different viewpoints, asking different questions, challenging questions it, from different perspectives, but they don't often talk about methodology. I think that this is something that we've discussed on this podcast before, right? That like economics is a little bit narrow because the methodologies that are accepted now only allow us to answer a narrow set of questions, questions that don't necessarily represent everything that's going on in the economy. And I, I think a lot of people don't fully understand what that means. For example, I get, or at least I got when I was a business school professor, this question of like, oh, do you spend all your time writing case studies? Here's an interesting fact. Maybe you should write a research paper about it. What I don't think regular people, not economists, understand is that like we can't do that kind of research. If I had written a case study as a junior professor, I probably would have gotten fired, right? I was doing enough crazy stuff already. Like writing case studies is highly discouraged. And if I ask a question just about how things are, that's considered overly descriptive, not a type of research that you're supposed to do. So I think that there needs to be a diversity of methodologies as well. Part of the reason I'm switching into law is because I think that I'll have much more freedom to answer a broader set of questions with a different set of tools in law that I don't have in finance. But I would like to emphasize something that Lisa Cook said about the relation between lack of diversity and what sociologists call uh, groupthink. Because I think that's, uh, that's very important. Groupthink is a phenomenon where very cohesive groups tend to all fall for the most extreme position and they reinforce each other into that extreme position, missing what is obvious. So I think that one of the advantages of having a very heterogeneous and diverse group of people is not that easy to form these cohesive groups that think alike. And there is more room for an actual debate on ideas rather than this is my idea and this is right and everybody who does not share this idea with me is not even a legitimate economist. Very often we hear this to marginalize people with ideas that don't fit the traditional view. To me, it's very important everybody feels accepted to be different physically, but also intellectually. And I think that in a place where you don't accept physical diversity, you don't accept also intellectual diversity. In a place where you're not used to physical diversity, you're not open to intellectual diversity. And to me, that's one of the biggest costs. So now that we understand what we're missing, we want to explore the various reasons why this lack of diversity exists. And we started to put this question to Anna Gifty. First and foremost, a lot of groups that are considered diverse don't find out about economics at all, right? What ends up happening is somebody will find out about economics much later in their career, such as myself, and they'll have to do a lot of sort of legwork to catch up to be considered competitive. I'm putting quotes, by the way, if people are listening to this, like, <laughs> you know, competitive for graduate school, right? So for example, I had a situation with someone recently who was told to do a bunch of different things with regards to catching up. You had to take math classes, you had to do a pre-doc, yada, yada, yada. And it's mm. very overwhelming when you're hearing that as somebody who thought you were doing the right thing the entire time. And then someone tells you, actually, there's 50 other things that you need to do to catch up. On a personal level, I can identify with a lot of this. Even though I came from an extremely privileged high school and you know town where I grew up, I still had no idea about how to become an economist or really what economics was when I first started studying it as an undergrad. To be honest, 
I just wanted to become an investment banker or work in sales and trading and you know make a lot of money when I grew up. And it seemed like studying economics was the best way to do that. At some point, you know, I tried it. I dipped my feet uh, in the investment banking world and realized that I hated it. So I asked my undergraduate advisor, what do I do? Is there any way that I can go to grad school? He said, why don't you think about a PhD? And I was like, there's no way I can afford six years of education. And he told me that I didn't have to pay for it. In fact, most PhD students get a stipend. And I, I just had no idea about this. You know, I had no idea that you even needed a PhD to become a professor. And that's in part because I don't have any PhD economists in my direct family. And so when I embarked on this journey to become an economist, I was a little bit behind, according to him, in terms of my course load. I hadn't taken all the rigorous math that you needed, all the advanced econ courses that you needed to get into the top programs. And so I crammed them into basically one year, my senior year of school. Fortunately, I had an advisor, uh, Jeff Myron, who was incredibly kind and supportive. And whenever I felt discouraged by the math or overwhelmed by the hard courses I was taking, he was simply like, yeah, you're fine. You can do it. Stop worrying. And I imagine that I wouldn't have been able to stick it out if I had had a different experience, if I had had an advisor who wasn't so supportive. So I think first and foremost, it's the lack of knowledge of what to do initially to prepare for a career in economics. And I think that also comes from the fact that people actually don't know what economists do. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. a lot of people assume economists are confined to the finance and banking space. I would say actually economists exist more so outside of that space than within yeah. that space. Actually, if you look at like financial analysts and that sort of thing, they're doing economics and econometrics work, but they're not considered economists. So in that sense, I think one thing that economists need to do better is just advertise economics. Right. For me, you know, it really boiled down to a conversation with a colleague that was talking about how he was studying community college remediation and using math to do it. And I was like, dude, I like studying education. How are you using math to study education? And that was really what kind of launched me into it. And another concept mm -hmm. that I really liked was human capital. And that was introduced to me through my first economics course ever. My professor spent a substantial amount of time telling us how human capital was tied to African economic development. And I was just like, this makes so much sense. Like, why didn't anybody explain this to me? That's like a big chunk of, you know, why people aren't interested in economics. And I will mm. say, you know, let me just say for the record, it's not because, you know, black and brown people can't do math, right? I think a lot of people will say, well, you know, it's just too rigorous. I'm not sure if they can handle it. They can. In fact, you know, black people Thank actually you. graduate at higher um higher shares in math degrees and at every level as compared to economics. So it's not about, you know, a lack of mathematical or quantitative training. If we're seeing mm -hmm. that, you know, the trends of diversity and inclusion are much better in other STEM disciplines, it's really about what are economists doing to actually make this field accessible. Um, I want to go back to an earlier point that you said, which is that this has nothing to do with black and brown people not being able to do math. Like they can do math, it's been established. That part. Have you ever gotten that sort of comment or that sort of suggestion that like, <laughs> oh, you know, the math is pretty serious? Yes, and I will, I will go ahead and shout out Dr. Dania Francis and her co-authors who have actually empirically shown this. So in high school, I was told that I couldn't major in math. I, I was told that it would be too hard for me and, you know, I did well in that person's class, but they seemed very convinced that because of the number of questions I asked, and I ask a lot of questions, <laughs> right, you know, that I, you know, like, I wouldn't be able to handle the rigor. But literally, that conversation shifted me from even considering math as a major until much later in my collegiate career. And I actually remember that moment when I decided to change my major. And so, you know, I was told that as a high schooler, and Dr. Dania Francis and her co-authors show that you know, they, there's empirical evidence that suggests that guidance counselors under-recommend Black girls for AP calculus courses, right? Courses wow. that would suggest that people can actually do math, and it could be a potential signal depending on what kind of career these young women want. So that actually happens, and I, I'm, you know, I'm living proof of that. The notion that Black people are defective in some way is pervasive in economics. 
So that's Lisa Cook again. So what do we know about the SAT? What is it, what, what is the variable that is most consistent with AS, SAT scores? So all you're telling me is that your, your parents are, are wealthy, parents' income. Are you getting the smartest kids or are you getting, let's say for admissions for uh, college, are you getting the smartest kids or are you getting the uh, wealthiest kids? I've, I've met a lot of well-educated people in my lifetime. I haven't met as many smart people. Where, 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 do, where does this come from? Especially if we think talent is uh, distributed uniformly across uh, populations. You know, when I was interviewing people for admissions at, at Harvard when I was at the Kennedy School, I would ask uh, some questions that my colleagues didn't even think of asking. We sometimes think in a very um, elitist way, and I think that's the profession. Cook also says economics keeps running into these entrenched issues of diversity because the profession really has a systemic problem with the way that it views diversity. Economics spends its time trying to prove whether discrimination exists. Other social sciences try to weigh in how to, on how to fix it. This distinction uh, allows this to, uh, to continue. We shouldn't be talking about the low level of patenting by African-Americans 100 years after its peak, right? I mean, it's, it's astonishing. There's something systemic here we have such a narrow view of what race does in our estimates, the role it plays in our estimates, that we, uh, we, we believe everything that, that all the work that that variable is doing, and we're not admitting what's behind it. What's behind that variable? Behind that variable is systemic racism, and we're not admitting that. We're not saying that, and we're not suggesting how to overcome that. So I'm just saying that I think we have uh, let the science become religion and indoctrinated us to think about race in a certain way. And I don't think it's a, a healthy way. It's a, it's a way that, that keeps people from being invited in. Also, Lisa Cook claims that economics still has not worked out to address its history of races. You probably know that we changed the name of the Eli Lecture to the AEA Distinguished Lecture. Why did we do that? There are uh, some people who represent ideas that are just so offensive, they would be an impediment to people engaging in economics. And this is one of them. This is a, the father of the AEA, right? And he was a eugenicist, a racist, um, you know, misogynist. And that's not welcoming to people in the profession. So. The American Economic Association commissioned a, a survey on the state of relationship in the economic profession vis-a-vis uh, -vis women and minorities. The report that has been released, at least in a condensed form, is not pretty because it suggests harassment of women is very diffuse and even treatment of minorities does not seem to be, let's put it in, in a mild way, uh, the best possible. They leave certain departments. They don't go to certain seminars. They avoid certain gatherings of economists. So this is what a number of the black women were reporting. You know, I, I guess I'm one of five black women who is in an economics department as a full professor. Well, look at those data. Look at all we have to do to avoid discrimination, whether it's due to gender or, or sex. We don't just report being discriminated against. We count. We counted the number of things that we had to do. So I'm saying we've got to address the fact that, that these things happen to Black people and to Black women. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I walked into NBER meetings and people will ask me if I'm a sociologist just because I'm, just because I'm Black. So it's not just a, it's not just a myth. We, we can keep asking uh, why is it that African Americans don't show up here? Well, you know, you're 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 taxing them. You're you're taxing them a lot to be here. And I'm hoping that we can figure out a way. Now that we can acknowledge the tax, how do we diminish that tax? And I'm hoping that we're doing something in the AEA now that I've been uh, elected to the executive committee 
And with all of the initiatives that are happening, I'm hoping that we're finding a way to minimize that tax. It's interesting to compare economics to other STEM fields. And who better to talk to about this than Rohan Williamson, who was trained as an engineer? I asked him, you know, STEM and economics are both quantitatively heavy. So if this is an issue of quantitative skill, then why is it the case that economics seems to be lagging behind STEM on the diversity front? No, it's different. It's different. And and because I think engineering has a longer history of trying, of also trying to deal with it. And I think one of the advantages you think about being an engineer, when you get a bachelor's degree, you're kind of, you're an engineer and you can work and learn at the firm that you're working at. And it's not uh, necessary, uh, especially if you're going to be in a field like you're going to design cars or planes. You could do it with, without a PhD, so it's it's less work and less schooling. Let's say uh, for one, and I think it's one of those uh, disciplines that's there at the lowest levels to say you know the main ingredient is good quantitative skills. And the other advantage to engineering, there's a fairly developed engineering nurturing programs in the U.S. for women and minorities. Right, that's not there in economics. And this is something that came up in economics probably fi- about 50 years ago at, through the AEA. And not a, not a lot of has been done to, and the percentage is about the same as it was 50 years ago. So economics has, uh, has, is, is not doing, I would say, as well as engineering. I think you're right on that, Kate. So far, we've focused on the lack of ethnic diversity in economics, right? Professors at top universities in economics aren't really representative of the U.S. population. But what about the international population of students and professors? What about international research? We took these questions back to Andres Lieberman. Foreign students from Latin America, the, the big issues typically are, are the language, um, the funding, and a general lack of knowledge of the process. And these are, these are big issues. Typically, the way they have been solved in the past is through a very idiosyncratic process, which is, you know, you find a, a, a local professor, say, in Chile, who is motivated enough and who has connections, who identifies promising students and you know, helps them get funding via government, uh, via grants, helps you with the applications, has connections for letters, et cetera. And so it's very much a, you know, depends on <laughs> where you are, who you work with, whether you're gonna, whether you're gonna do it or not. In Chile, for example, Chile has been, has his, his uh, long tradition of academic economists, and so, they go back to Chile and they're forming a new generation of economists and they have connections. So they've been able to send a steady stream of, of Chilean economists to get, to, to get formed. You know, part of them go back to Chile and continue this process. So maybe that's, you know, that's one way to break this cycle of underrepresentation. And this is something that uh, Lopez experienced firsthand as first generation immigrant. One obstacle was, was just a general understanding of how the U.S. education system uh, really works. Uh, My parents, they went to school in Mexico, so that when they came here to the United States, they, they of course, did not go to school here, and they weren't able to provide me with a lot of the soft information to help me guide through, guide me through high school or or through college. And I always felt that I didn't discover uh, the right path, or I didn't know about the right path until after the fact. So, Mm -hmm. for example, I did not know what the value of honors classes was until I was in my senior year. I didn't Mm -hmm. know that... The SAT exams was something that you needed to study for. I thought it was just something that everybody took at some stage and, and was placed. And for, for my first couple of years, I was following the path that my sister took. I saw that she went to college. I saw that she went to graduate school. school. So I said, well, if she's doing that, I think I need to do that too. I need to go to college. I need to go to graduate school. Of course, we chose different fields, but the whole idea of just going to college really relied on, on just looking at what my older sister was doing. And for the most part, that strategy did work out. Other times it did not. If it wasn't for me taking AP tests and and AP calculus, I would have placed in remedial math and that would have um, set me back a few semesters in college and been detrimental to my career. So in some sense, I, I, I sometimes lucked out. But so for you personally, Luigi, right? You raised your kids here in the US. Did you know what classes to tell them to take? Did you know how to, you know, tutor them on the SATs and like how they should act in college and stuff like that? Actually, not really in a sense. For example, I did not 
know how to play the game early on. Uh, I learned later that to maximize your kid's uh, chance of getting to good college, you need to have them play fancy sports like lacrosse. Honestly, I didn't even know lacrosse existed as a sport. And so uh, let alone have my kids sort of play it in order to maximize their chances to get into school. So yes, there is this institutional knowledge, but in the grand scheme of things, I was lucky because being an academic, I could at least go and ask other people. Clearly, if you come from underrepresented minority, I think that there's lack of institutional knowledge is a huge barrier to entry. So what can we do to fix these issues? So what a difficult question. Uh, this, is a, this is a difficult question, Kate. Uh, you know, I, so I think I, I, I do believe in temporary affirmative action, you know, at least for a, for a period of time. I, I do think we need to accept more women and more minority students in our PhD programs. I think this is important. I'm, I'm also in favor of extending evaluation periods during maternity, you know, extending your tenure clock. Also, I think editors and in general people, people who are influential have a role to be more inclusive to different ideas, different tests of existing theories, different data sets. And I think, I think naturally this is going to lead to more, uh, to more voices and more diverse voices showing up. And what does Anna Gifty think? It's a good question. First and foremost, I don't claim to be an expert on this, right? I think a lot of times people are like, oh, you know, you, you found the Sadie Collective, so you must know everything. No, there's people who've been doing this for a long time. The National Economic Association, for example, has existed for 50 years, right? And there is a committee on the status of minority and economics, specifically within the AEA, that has also focused on this for quite some time. So what I will say is- But if is it's my, been around for so long, then why haven't they fixed it yet? So. You no, know, that's not, that's not, I'm not going to say nothing about that. <laughs> but what I'll say I is, you, say, you know, they've done their best. And I think that they've pushed the envelope to a certain degree. And I think now mm -hmm. my generation is taking on that mantle and moving it to the next level. And so what I will say is, you know, one thing I did recently, a couple months ago, like pretty much when the protests were picking up, was I, I mentioned in a, a Twitter thread that, you know, a lot of economists don't have black colleagues, right? Your, talk, your, your, your papers are focusing on race and discrimination and bias, yet you have never co-authored with a black economist or a black scholar in the economics and related field spectrum. That's a problem, right? You cannot be talking about these issues, talking about how much you care about diversity and inclusion and not actually have black colleagues that you work with. The first thing is you need to look for some black colleagues to work with on any forthcoming paper that's talking about topics that are in their realm. And it doesn't have to be about race and discrimination. You have black macroeconomists who are looking at, you know, economic trends in different countries. You have those who are focusing on development economics, right? We're, we're talking about just having folks that can give you a, a much richer perspective because they are closer to the data. They're closer to the experience that you are evaluating. So I think that's the first sort of tangible thing that people can do. And I mean, the, ne the next thing in the same realm is citing more Black economists. There's an entire journal dedicated to the work of Black economists, the review of Black political economy that is, you know, produced by the National Economic Association. That journal is rich with perspectives from Black economists and analyses that I would say, you know, rival many of the top five journals, right? You know, th these people are trained in the same way, even if it's not in the same exact way. They're trained in the same methodology um, or trained to think about the same methodology in different ways. And, and that's invaluable if we're talking about bringing out the best idea for some of the, these pressing problems that we are addressing today. And I think on the other hand of that is thinking about the pipeline and the pathway, right? You know, if you, if every econ faculty committed to mentoring one Black woman, that would dramatically increase the number of Black women who would probably enter the profession. What this all boils down to is commitment. Are people committed to seeing a more diverse and inclusive economics profession? That's going to require some work on your part. It's not enough to, quote unquote, you know, mentor and push up people who are already on their way to that place. It's about getting those who are on the verge or people who haven't even considered it um, to actually consider economics as a profession. Another person trying to tackle this issue from the ground up is Dean Henry. I, I started something called the PhD Excellence Initiative in 2013, 
to try to increase, it's funded by the Sloan Foundation, the goal of the PhD Excellence Initiative is to increase representation in economics of African Americans, underrepresented minorities. So the assumption on which I work when I run the PhD Excellence Initiative is that race and talent are not correlated, but opportunity and talent are, okay? Now, what difference does that assumption make? Well, it makes a big difference if you know, a kid walks into your office who you know, is from a you know, Pell Grant family and has been an undergraduate at NYU and you know, has a good but not great grade point average because you know, we're very hierarchical economics, right? Do you assume that the kid just isn't quite good enough to cut it in economics or say, you know what, actually, what, what, what I, what I, what, what's true about the kid sitting in front of me, if he's able to, if he, he's able to get a, a you know, almost three, five at, NY, at NYU, coming from a Pell Grant family, he must have a huge unobserved fixed effect. So you don't use one of our terms, right? So if you, you make the assumption that race and talent are not correlated, but race and opportunity are, then your mind is just open to, say, to seeing those unobserved fixed effects. Think about the admissions process to PhD programs, right? You know, there's, there's, there's false negatives and false positives, okay? So think about your typical application pool. Let's say, let's say 3,000 people will apply to University of Chicago PhD program in economics, okay? There are gonna be a lot of white guys in that application pool. A bunch of guys who could have done the program are gonna get rejected, right? So there are a bunch of, you know, essentially call, call, call it false negatives, or maybe even cases where you know they could do the program, but you just gotta make a choice, right? But the cost to society and to a profession of those false negatives is really small. But if we apply that same filter, okay, to all students, and let's say you, got, let's say you, let's say you have five applicants who are black, and they get thrown out with the false negatives, it's a huge cost. Because it's a huge cost because if you look at it, like, you know, I think in 2017, there were, I think, like 3% 3, 3 of the PhDs awarded in, in um, in 2017, were the, were the blacks. So in a pool in which every year there's only 15 black people getting a PhD in economics, if you're throwing out one or two false negatives in every admissions pool, that's a huge delta on the field, right? When we make PhD admissions decisions, we also make a bunch of, there are a bunch of false positives as well. We admit students we shouldn't, we shouldn't admit. And that's not, that's not particularly costly to programs as long as you don't do too, too many of those. If you advise those students, yes, it can be very costly, right? <laughs> Fair enough. But we know that we admit false positives all the time, and but it's not such a big deal if we if we if, if we admit, if we admit false positives for white students. But we make a huge deal, like we like we're living in fear. We're going to admit one, you know, you admit one black student who maybe shouldn't have gotten admitted. Well, we know we've admit scores and scores of white students who shouldn't have gotten admitted. So what's the you know? We just we have we have a cost benefit analysis off because I think we're not thinking about the data in the way uh, we should. And finally, Lisa Cook runs the AEA Summer Program, which tries to actually mentor people in order to give the opportunities that other people naturally receive through their background, families, connections, but offer this opportunity to minority students. And every single year of the AEA summer program, I learn about some obscure university, some obscure community college I've never heard of. And these kids are extraordinary. They, and they take these exams, uh, you know, these coding exams, uh, say that are offered by uh, JPL and other pre-doc programs, and they perform just like everybody else. But that's because they have had the exposure. That's not, you know, and it, it, it doesn't take much extra work. This may seem like I am on the defensive. I'm not. I'm quite hopeful because I think people, people learn, they confront, and they change. And I'm hoping that the economics profession will also be that way. So, Luigi, do you think that we have covered all of the ways that we can fix this problem? Yeah, let me try to, to summarize, because I think that there are basically three possible causes, and I'm not saying they're mutually exclusive. Number one is lack of information of training early on due to economic disadvantage. The second could be that the profession 
put some criteria to admit that are not gender neutral or not ethnicity or race neutral. And the third one, which is actually the one that worries me the most because is the one that we're probably most responsible if that's true, and also the one that is harder to, to fix, is that the profession somehow is hostile in its nature to diversity and to people that don't conform. That there is a, a very strong consensus on what is the right way to do economics and implicitly also who are the right people doing economics. Of course, all three play some role, but Kate, what do you think is the most important? If you were to address one first, where would you start? My answer is always education, especially early stage education. And I think this is particularly true for this issue. I don't know for sure what this looks like, but this is kind of like the question you raised earlier, Luigi, like, you know, how many children of farmers are out there? How many children from like poorer backgrounds are out there? If we remove all international students and professors, and if we remove people who don't have any academics in their family, I think that actually the pool of like American professors is also maybe not underrepresented, uh, but it's people who got lucky at some point in their careers. So I think that like generally we just need to bulk up earlier stage education. But uh, no, let, let's go, keep going on, on the difference. So I think on the education, I completely agree. But you are probably better positioned than I am in, in saying that. In, and do you think that we have kind of an intolerance problem to our diversity in economics? Yes. I mean, right, if anyone feels like seriously offended or discriminated against, let's problematic and especially when you start hearing the same story over and over <laughs> becomes a systemic problem now some of the guests that we spoke to didn't think it was a huge problem and other people have had worse experiences um but it seems like there's enough evidence that there is hostility and harassment towards people in the profession i certainly <laughs> have experienced enough to the point that it would make your skin crawl if i relate all my stories to you about the creepiness that I've been on the receiving end of. But I don't want to, you know, I don't want to dwell on the negative. I just want to to make the point that there is a harassment problem and there seems to be not a whole lot of attention to fixing it, right? Like we, we've talked about it at various points in the profession. There have been some high profile cases, some of which we've discussed here on this podcast. But I don't think like any of my advisors when I was in grad school had to take sexual harassment training. I don't think any of them took like sensitivity training. And it's surprising because if you worked anywhere else, right, if you work in the industry, if you work in big tech, like you have to do these things every year. And so why is it that professors, people who are constantly interacting with students who are in like a, a weaker position to them, who are beholden to them, uh, they don't have to take that kind of training. It's, it's crazy to me. I think that economists, they feel more justified of their privileges. Our theories tend to say and derive that uh, the people emerging, they emerge because they deserve. Yes, we have some friction, but by and large, the, our models tend to, uh, if you have a higher beta or theta, whatever Greek letter it represents, uh, talent, ability, etc., you prevail and you make more money, and that premium is uh, compensating for that talent and in a sense deserve, and, and so on and so forth. So there is not a lot of discussion in economics about people that are get a rent uh, not deserving and stuff like that. So our entire sort of uh, structure of economics tend to justify the, the rent of the people who are at the top of the economic ladder, and in particular, the people at the top of the economic profession. So that makes, I think, the field less open to listen to challenges or to listen to questions about the entire structure. In its uh, purest uh, form or in its best version, the capitalist system is not only competitive, but also allows and favors diversity because, as uh, Gary Becker sir said, when there is competition, it is more costly to have uh, biased preferences for one group versus another. So competition is one force that can solve these problems. But I'm sorry to say many of the fields, including academia, 
competition takes so long to walk, I think we need to find uh, some other me mechanism. This is where the profession has been, in my view, a bit slow because we rely on, uh, say, competition will uh, walk its magic and not realizing that uh, maybe that will be after we're dead and we want to have some change in our lifetime. Well, it seems to me that's what this episode has been about, is having more competition, right? Because if you have different types of ideas and people approaching questions from different perspectives, then you'll have more competition and you'll have more people pushing back against what's considered established knowledge. And so that's, you know, it's one and the same. The diversity is a form of competition. But, but there are two aspects. One is that diversity leads to more competition and better outcomes. But also, if you don't have enough competition, you don't have enough diversity. So it's both cause and effect. Fortunately, we don't have to identify the two apart. Otherwise, uh, we cannot publish the paper. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but of course, a joke. <laughs> the, the two are, are intrinsically uh, connected. And to me, if I see lack of diversity is an indication of some form of bias to entry, some form of lack of competition. As Lisa Cook said, the talents are equally distributed. And so if you see a gigantic difference and a persistent difference, there must be some, some issue. And the question is, uh, which one and how to fix it? Before we let Kate go, I would like to, first of all, thank her for this uh, fantastic two and a half years. Saying that I could not have done it without you is not just a way of saying, I think it's the truth. You actually knew so much more about even how to think about podcasting that I could possibly imagine. <laughs> you pushed me to analyze a lot of topics that I naturally would not have analyzed, and, um, and I'm glad I did. I learned a lot from you. When you talk about uh, diversity, I think that if you have not experienced it on the job, you don't see the value. I, I, I was very fortunate because I did experience in my academic life and I did experience with Kate in my uh, podcasting <laughs> life. And, um, and I think I, may I say, I am a better man as a result. That's probably one of the best compliments I've ever been paid. So thank you, Luigi. Oh, I'm sad. No, I'm crying. You can't, I'm not crying not crying. <laughs> um, I want to thank our listeners who have been awesome. Probably half of the downloads we've gotten have been my dad. <laughs> so thanks, dad. But I think at a certain point, other people started listening to the show. And, you know, I've got a lot of emails, even sat next to a listener on a Southwest plane ride once. Um, so, you know, thanks for for listening and for the feedback and for reaching out to me and for talking to me. Thanks to our awesome producer, Matt, who takes this like gobbledygook that we produce over the course of hours and somehow distills it into something that sounds reasonable in half an hour. Uh, I don't think that anyone can do that better than he can. Um, and thanks, Luigi. It's been a good two and a half years. I would say that I've learned a ton from you, but that was already true before I even met you because I'd like already read all your papers in college, and, you know, already read your book and stuff. But I think what has surprised me the most over these past couple years is that number one, you put your money where your mouth is. I think more than most economists, maybe any economist I know. And by that, I mean that you're always talking about how we need like competition, right? We need open markets. And I don't think anyone likes to argue <laughs> and to think about different ideas and different perspectives and new topics uh, more than you. So that has been really cool uh, to be able to experience. And then finally, I have given you crap on this show for being older than me. And you know, occasionally I make fun of your TV and movie preferences or, or lack thereof. But I, I swear to God, you are, you have like 10 times more energy than I have and are like probably one of the youngest seeming people I know. Uh, and that's been an inspiration. So. I hope that you continue to bring that energy to this podcast and uh, to the rest of your research. And that's because it's it's benefited the world so much. And uh, there's still a lot that we're going to get from Luigi Zingales. Uh, <laughs> I try to. <laughs> <laughs> As to the future of the podcast, 
Capitalism will do a very European thing. We'll take a break during the month of August, but don't be afraid. We're going to be with you by releasing a special couple of episodes and some re-release of our key features. And then in September, we're going to come back with a new co-host. Mm-hmm.